Ladies and gentlemen, good morning uh, and welcome to this British Chambers of Commerce webinar uh, entitled Discover Singapore Business Opportunities for British Companies. My name is Adam Marshall. I'm the Executive Director for Policy and External Affairs at the British Chambers of Commerce based in London and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to host this webinar today with expert colleagues uh, from the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore and two excellent experts uh, from uh, related businesses who are here to tell us about the ins and outs of doing business in Singapore. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, we are now restarting our webinar series as we build your global business network. Uh, it's great pleasure for us at the VCC to be working with British Chambers of Commerce, not just in the UK, but in an increasing number of markets across the globe. Uh, and as Singapore was the first of those markets to receive BCC accreditation last year, uh, it's only fitting that we restart the webinar series with business opportunities in Singapore. Just in terms of housekeeping for today's session, uh, this webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube so more businesses can benefit from it um, over the coming weeks and months. Um, and our panelists, Carol McCarthy, Mark Chowdhury and Graham Harkness, have all said to us that they want uh, all participants to be able to ask them personal questions offline as well if there's a question you do not feel that you can ask in the open forum today. Um, so just do signal that and we will make sure that uh, you are hooked up to the appropriate expert to ask a question on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, without further ado, I then want to introduce our expert panelists. Uh, first of all, we have Carol McCarthy, who is Business Services Manager at the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Carol is going to give us an overview of why British businesses should do business in Singapore this morning. And she's joined by Mark Chowdhury of McGrath Global and Graham Harkness, who's Director of Intro International. Now, Mark is a qualified UK solicitor, um, Director of McGrath Global in Singapore and a partner. Um, and uh, Mark is a basically a top-rated immigration lawyer and has expensive experience, extensive experience of advising clients on immigration issues uh, that arise from trying to get around the globe and in Singapore in particular. And he can also advise on a range of other issues legally related to doing business in Singapore. And Graham uh, at Intro International uh, began his career with an international accountancy and business advisory form, but, inter uh, but joined Intro International as a director in 2012 uh, to assist SMEs from a variety of different sectors to establish their businesses and expand them into Asia successfully and sustainably. So between Carol, Mark and Graham, you have a great panel this morning. Without further ado, can I hand over to Carol to tell us really why we should be doing business in Singapore? Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Adam, for the very kind introduction. Um, as um, Adam has mentioned, my name is Carol McCarthy, and I'm delighted to present you this webinar today on Discovering Singapore and the Business Opportunities. Um, I thought it is interesting to show you a picture of the um, Singapore Business District. As you can see, it's a modern, vibrant, and busy business district. Um, we'll go straight into a presentation of where Singapore is located. Singapore is uh, located as a strategic location. It's at the very heart of the ASEAN region, which is the Association for the Southeast Asian Nation. Uh, there you go. We have a map there that went back, back very quickly, uh, showing you actually where um, Singapore lies. Uh, the ASEAN, that's it. There we go. We have the map. Um, the ASEAN was founded in the 60s, and it now has about 10, it has 10 member countries. It, has a population of over 600 million people. At present, it ranks seven largest in the global economy, but it's forecast to be in fourth place by 2030, so growth forecast. The diversity of the region is a good opportunity. There will be a large number of people rising to middle income in the next few years. Singapore is the most developed economy in this region. And it's often uh, referred as the gateway of the springboard to business in the region. On the next slide, we can see a map of Singapore, uh, just to show you that it's located at the very tip of Malaysia. The next slide, please. There we go. 
Now, on the next slide again, just a brief introduction of Singapore. It's a small country but wealthy city state. Um, this year, Singapore is celebrating 50 years. There are a lot of celebrations taking place in early August around the SG50 celebrations. Singapore was founded as a British trading colony in 1819. Um, then it joined the Malaysian Federation in 1963 and separated two years later. And now Singapore is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. Some key facts about Singapore, as I mentioned, it's a small country. There are 5.47 million people living in Singapore. <laughs> the GDP per capita is over 52,000 US dollars. When you compare it with the UK GDP per capita, which a year earlier was just under 42,000 US dollars. The un unemployment rate is low at 2%, and uh, it has an inflation rate of 1.4%, and it's a highly educated um, workforce. Uh, literacy is at 95.9%. Singapore is a multiracial and multicultural society, everybody living together in pretty good harmony. Um, just to give you some ethnicity background, about 74% of the population are Chinese, 14% are Malay, 9% are Indian, and the other 3% are made of other Asian country or the expat community. Now, looking more into why Singapore, why do business in Singapore and the opportunities for business uh, here, especially for the UK companies? Well, we have strong links uh, to the UK. It's very easy to set up a business here. English is the business language, which also makes it very easy. It's a very low tax environment. Uh, it has a stable government with a strong rule of, rule of law which implies low level of corruption, um, high protection of uh, intellectual property, and a robust court system based on the British law. Um, some rankings there on Singapore. Um, it was voted the easiest place to do business for the eighth time running. It's one of the most competitive economies for the past four years. It has the top airport worldwide. It's amongst the top two countries for port infrastructure. It's the number one country in Asia for IP protection. It's the number one city in personal safety. Um, there are strong links, strong historical and cultural links um, between the UK and Singapore. The UK is Singapore's fifth largest uh, foreign direct investor. There are 33,000 British residents who live in Singapore and we estimate about 1,000 British companies um, established in Singapore. On the next slide, uh, we'll have a quick look at the low tax environment. Okay, Singapore is one of the lowest corporation tax in the world at 17%. There are no capital gains tax, and the individual taxation ranges from zero to 20%, and the goods and services tax, the GST, is at 7%. The economic policy framework is uh, pro-business, pro-foreign investment, open and export earnings. Um, Singapore is well regarded as a triple A rated economy. It's a very open trading regime. It has very few import and export duties. But 99% of all imports enter duty free. Um, Singapore is the fourth uh, global financial center. It's also the largest transshipment center and the third biggest oil refining center. Um, all businesses that wish to operate in Singapore must register with the ACRA, which is the Accounting Regulatory Authority of Singapore. It's actually an easy online process, and there are three common forms of the companies that can be registered, foreign registered branch, a representative office, or a private limited company. Um, the chart showing here, here now gives an overview of the share of the GDP by industry. As you can see, manufacturing, wholesale, and retail uh, both account for 18% of the market share. Uh, business services then following at 16%. Finance and insurance at 12%. And then transport and storage and construction at 5%. So there are strong opportunities in the financial services and business services. 
the other key opportunity sectors um, include the ICT and uh, creative industry, the fintech industry, tourism, biomedical, and the high-end manufacturing is still a key pillar uh, the, in Singapore. And there is a clear government strategy to support companies who are looking to set up in those areas, and there is quite a lot of funding available. Um, I would like now to introduce and speak a bit about the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. On the next slide, back this. Um, British Chamber of Singapore is one of the largest international chambers in Singapore. We actually celebrated our 60-year anniversary last year. Uh, we're a strong business-led network with 15 established sectorial groups. We organize over 90 events per year. Um, we have 2,700, over 2,700 members and a company network of over 400 companies. British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore was the first overseas chamber to achieve accreditation by the British Chamber of Commerce in London. And um, all our members have access to our office facilities, which is especially useful for our overseas members. We have strong um, regional connections uh, with the other chambers in the region. Uh, Britain in Southeast Asia is a network of all the British chambers within the region pretty much mirroring the ASEAN uh, region. We organize conferences twice a year and have regular uh, conference calls with the other British chambers in the region. Uh, business support services uh, within the chamber and how we can help you uh, to do business here in Singapore. Uh, business support services, we are a private sector-led delivery partner for UKTI to help and support the UK companies who are looking to do business in Singapore. Uh, we offer a range of service, uh, advisory services. Uh, first of all, we can give a certain amount of information on legislation regulation and also put you in touch with some of our partners and members who would be able to give you further details. We can also assist you with uh, events like organizing uh, trade shows, product launch, networking events, we can uh, do market studies, being uh, either sector research or some competitors' analysis. We do quite a lot of business matching for companies who are looking to identify suitable business partners here in Singapore, being a distributor, an agent, or clients. And we organize one-to-one -one meetings with those potential partners. Um, our knowledge exchange, delivering webinar, for example, like we're doing today, and then what we call missions, which could be any of the combinations of any of the above. Um, since June 2013, we have supported over 500 UK companies uh, who are looking to do business in Singapore. Um, here are just a, a couple of companies that we have had. Um, Thermatech, for example. We did some market research for them. Um, we did a full competitor's analysis, identified suitable partners for them, and set up a whole program of meetings for them, um, which was very successful. Another company we have out is Sheffield Forge Masters International. We identified a suitable contacts for them, and then organized a launch event at Raffles Hotel here in Singapore. Um, we also have links to all the major stakeholders here in Singapore and can help you gain access to some of the information on the grant funding available and put you in touch with the local government agencies. Um, there are funding available particularly in projects of innovation and productivity enhancement, some technology adoption and um, land saving research strategic industry and business expansion. Uh, for any specific advice or any uh, market research or business support that you would like, I would uh, encourage you to contact us directly at the British Chamber of Commerce. You can uh, contact me either by phone or by email at carol at britcham.org.sg. And also check our website, britcham.org.sg, where you can find a lot of resources and tools on how to enter the Singaporean market. 
Um, I guess I'm going to hand back to Adam. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this short presentation. We look forward to welcome you to Singapore, and um, we look forward to your questions now. Thank you. Carol, thank you very much indeed. And I think I certainly learned a lot from that overview presentation, particularly Singapore being the gateway to ASEAN and being sort of the springboard for the whole of the Southeast Asian region. Um, additionally, I think some of the things that Chamber of Commerce members will find attractive, the competitiveness of the Singapore economy, that great legal framework, and of course that excellent infrastructure uh, uh, as well. Um, what I'd like to do now, if we can, is actually bring in uh, Graham Harkness, director from Intro International, and Mark Chowdhury, partner at uh, McGrath Global. Um, Graham is someone who can help with understanding how business expansion can work in Singapore, just to remind you, those who are attending, uh, and Mark is someone who can help understand the legal challenges and in particular the immigration challenges uh, that come along with establishing business in Singapore. Um, Graham, let me start with you, if I can. Um, could you give us a bit of a snapshot of the requirements for setting up a company in Singapore? Carol referred to it briefly uh, in her opening presentation. I was wondering if you could take us through that in a little bit more detail. Yeah, sure. Um, as Carol touched on, it's a, it's a very simple process to get up and running here. Um, there's three main things you need. It's a registered business address in Singapore, company secretary for your company, and the key thing is the nominee resident director. So that's a Singaporean, someone on a work pass here, or a permanent resident. Um, now, you can obviously employ companies like ours to provide that nominee service for you. But the key thing that's different from Singapore to the rest of Southeast Asia is your company, despite having that local director, can still be completely 100% foreign owned. So you retain the ownership despite having to, to have that for, uh, director in place. So there's no need effectively to establish a joint venture as we see in some other markets around the world. It's simply to ensure that your regulatory and process requirements are in place where you need Singaporean residents involved. Yes, that's right. Spot on, yeah. Excellent. Um, and Carol also mentioned that this is a fairly efficient process and those of us who are, are uh, experienced in dealing with different bureaucracies around the world always have uh, tales to tell. But I, I, I gather that uh, in the Singaporean market, those tales tend to be positive. Does it take particularly long to set up a company? Uh, it doesn't. I mean, depending on the type of entity you choose, whether it's a representative office, a branch office, or the, the private limited company, the easiest is actually the private limited company. It can be done fairly quickly. The admin burden for a branch office, because it's seen as an extension of your headquarter, is slightly more onerous, so that takes slightly longer. And then your representative office goes through uh, a body called uh, IE Singapore. So you submit the application for a, a rep office to them. It can take uh, seven to ten days. But um, nothing takes too long. You know, you hear the, the tales of six months elsewhere in Southeast Asia, but it's, it's nothing like that here. Yes, so uh, I guess that's why so many British businesses are looking at Singapore as the place to establish their base to get into some of those other Southeast Asian markets where things are a bit harder, isn't it? Yeah, of course. I mean, a huge number of our clients that we have on, on board at the moment, um, even up to 100% of their operations will be elsewhere in Southeast Asia, but they use Singapore as a holding company, as a base. Uh, it makes it much more attractive for you know, um, ease of raising capital, uh, exit strategies from the business, um, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's a really good um, headquarter, even if you're looking elsewhere in the region. Right, so it becomes head office and sometimes you'll have business in Singapore itself and sometimes you'll have business all over. Um, but what, if you, if you were thinking about the types of companies that you have on your books, the types of companies that you've helped, are some of them actually quite small indeed or are most of them medium sized or larger companies? Yeah, I mean it ranges from companies with uh, from say 500,000 turnover all the way up to, to the bigger SMEs, but yeah, we, we see all sizes of companies coming through. Well, that's interesting for us, of course, because some companies here in the UK who are at the smaller end of the spectrum see it as somewhat daunting to really get established in overseas markets. Is Singapore a good stop for some of, first stop for some of those uh, companies? <laughs> yeah, there couldn't be an easier place to, to test the water, to be honest. Yeah, things are pretty simple, as Carl touched on. The, uh, the tax system is straightforward. 
the legal system it replicates the UK and common language is English so there's there's no better place to test the market Graham, th thank you I, I want to bring in Mark there because you mentioned the legal system um, and Mark of course that is your speciality I know you've got a, a, a particular in-depth focus on on immigration and I suppose for a lot of companies thinking about coming into the Singapore market given the ease of access that Graham has just mentioned the one thing that will be on their minds is the access from an immigration sense as it is from a company registration and setup sense. Uh, exactly, same as Singapore. Um, just going back, um, Singapore replicates the English common law system. So when, it, when a company is due to set up in, in Singapore, they are confident that uh, agreements will be carried out, agreements will be con contained within the legal uh, framework and the structure. Um, and that they have the right to actually continue their business. Um, I think Carol mentioned in relation to IP protection, um, Singapore is number one in the region. So for new businesses setting up, uh, they do have a pretty good legal framework to actually re rely on to actually carry out their business. Um, in particular to immigration, um, immigration like uh, the rest of the world uh, it is seeing a tightening of restrictions. Um, I'm sure you can uh, agree with the UK uh, being immigration being quite a political forefront or a uh, big movement. Um, in Singapore in 2014, uh, on the 1st of August, uh, they uh, implemented what's known as the Fair Consideration Framework. The Fair Consideration Framework was made mandatory to all firms and all companies operating in Singapore. Um, yet the part of the framework is where every company must implement fair hiring practices in respect to local workers as well as foreign workers. Um, that doesn't mean that Singapore has got a closed book when it comes to immigration. Um, there are a number of different work passes. Um, employment passes are generally the main pass which an individual will obtain when they're looking to actually work in Singapore. However, there are sort of highly skilled passes such as uh, the personalized employment pass and there are uh, passes at the, the lower end of the spectrum for sort of semi-skilled and lower skilled workers. Um, there are a number of options, however, obviously it is getting tighter and tighter um, and companies need to sort of show they have a long-term intention to remain in the jurisdiction mm -hmm. as well as it's very strong to show that companies will be looking to hire local workers as well as to complement their foreign workers. Um, so but overall it's... Uh, it's, it's one of the, the the more simple immigration systems around the world and, and going back to the liaison with the authorities, uh, it's a very, very efficient public service. So you know how long things are going to take um, and it, you can work very well with the Ministry of Manpower here in Singapore. So effectively, if your business is, is planning to stay in market for a while, you shouldn't expect to have more than the usual procedural difficulties that anyone might have in this area. Is that a fair assessment? It, it, exactly. Exactly. You're showing that the individuals generally need to have experience in their area of expertise. And in mm -hmm. most cases, business owners can quite easily show that and evidence that. Um, it is fairly open and fairly transparent in relation to obtaining those passes. So for ease of business, uh, the Ministry of Manpower is very receptive to new business and for growing businesses from overseas. I think I wished uh, for many of us in the UK that we had something called the Ministry of Manpower because even the title of the ministry relates directly to business needs and to the labour market as opposed to what we do have which uh, sort of uh, seems more inclined to keep people out than help people get in. So it sounds like uh, the, the right source of uh, starting point, the right source of legal climate. Um, but one thing a lot of companies will be concerned about, uh, understandably, uh, when they make applications uh, for work passes and work authorizations is how long they will take. Um, because of course we've all had tales here in the UK of how long it can take and passports mouldering in the basements of government offices for six months at a time. Is it a relatively quick process in Singapore? It, it's a rel relatively quick process. The, the general processing times for employment pass applications are seven to ten working days uh, for established companies. We would have generally advise that new companies are setting up operations. We look at about four to six weeks mm -hmm. from start of document collection to approval of that work pass. Um, obviously, uh, with any sort of new business, uh, the Ministry of Manpower would like to have a, uh, quite an in-depth look into what that business is doing, how they will operate, 
whilst they're in the jurisdiction. Um, so we work with our clients, obviously, to pull out as many, uh, as much aspects of that business that can then be passed on to the MOM. Um, but we are, we would usually advise four to six weeks is a good sort of starting point uh, in in respect to obtaining the necessary work authorization. So four to six weeks for the necessary migration uh, legals. Uh, Graham, that amount of time doesn't seem to be necessary for the for the for company setup. It seems to be even faster than that. Yeah, it is. It's even faster. The, the key thing in the process is um, you first establish your entity. Uh, once that's up and running, it's at that point you go on to apply for the employment passes. But right. the, uh, the establishment of the entity is, is straightforward. So if you were a UK business between the two of you planning your entry into the Singapore market, once you've taken the decisions and done some of your due diligence work, you could be looking at a period of, of, of as little as two to three months to get some of the requisite uh, uh, sort of incorporation and legals done. Yes, yeah, you could you could have an entity in two to three days, a bank account five days after that, and an employment pass so be in a position to trade within a month, month and a half. I suppose one question that then comes to mind on that basis, and Carol, if I can bring you in on this one as well, that would be excellent, is why more British companies don't think about Singapore as a first stop in exports and doing business overseas. Um, so many of them will think of markets like the United States where actually it's incredibly difficult to set up and do business and often you need multiple approvals that take a fair bit of time. What can we do collectively to make people realize that Singapore is a great first stop? Well, I guess educating people, letting them know how easy it can be. Um, I guess it's the distance uh, can be a, an issue in people's mind. Um, you know, it's a 13-hour flight to get to get here. Uh, at the moment, where we have a seven-hour time difference, so maybe you know this this can be seen as a as an issue for some companies. But you know, I think um, in the presentation there we showed that I mean Singapore is a great place to set up as a base to the rest of Southeast Asia. That the region has a great potential for growth in the next few years. So um, I think there are great there are great uh, uh, pros for setting up here. Also, Singapore is really good in terms of the connectivity it has within the region. I mean, it is it is very well organized, um, and there are a lot of uh, flights available out of Singapore that you, enables you to reach the whole region very quickly and very efficiently. If I remember correctly, Changi Airport is constantly rated as one of the world's top airports, if not the top airport. Is that also correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of us who are business people who have passed through some less salubrious places trying to, to get to where we are doing business, I think Singapore is probably considered a favoured stop in that respect. Um, Definitely. Um, we, we work with uh, quite a number of companies that obviously use uh, the time difference to their advantage as well as the location. Um, with the UK, obviously the eight-hour working, uh, eight working day Singapore has already done the eight hours, so for certain companies it's, it's good to utilize having both days. There is a, a one or two hour sort of lap over time, which means that if you have your operations in both jurisdictions, the UK and Singapore, you really do extend that working day, um, and as well as having the connectivity around the region, uh, business leaders or individuals and employees from the company can easily travel up to China, up to the Hong Kong, down to uh, Indonesia and such like. And it is a very, very open and easy way of doing business. We have talked a little bit about the cost of doing business from the regulatory and legal sense uh, and also in terms of taxation. But one thing I was wondering if we could touch on a little bit is how expensive it is to do business on a day-to-day -day basis in Singapore. What are labor costs like, for example, um, you know, uh, is it an expensive environment to operate on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to one that is so competitive on the tax uh, front uh, and in terms of uh, the legal framework? Yeah, uh, I think uh, as Carol touched on, it is a wealthy state and as such um, prices across the board have gone up, uh, property uh, salaries are high. Um, but having said that, tax is very low. From a company point of view, it's uh, an extremely advantageous place uh, 
uh, tax wise uh, for newly formed companies in each of the first three years after you incorporate the first 200,000 of profit is completely tax free and that's in each of the first three years so really quite generous uh, and also going back to the, the funding and, and uh, incentives available there's what's called the, the product and innovation credit um, so that's any Singapore company who spends money on things to improve their process efficiency, whether that's hardware, software, um, training courses, up to 400% of the cost on that can be um, written off against your, your tax bill. So it's, it's really, despite there being high cost, uh, it's sort of balanced out by the, the tax system. So when you, when you net out the cost of doing business, they're actually, they're actually quite competitive. Um, and I suppose that working with yourself and, uh, and and with the chamber, it becomes easier to figure out what the opportunities are, isn't it, to uh, to, to net off some of the the higher day-to-day -day costs against uh, your tax bill and various other things. Yeah, sure, sure. Excellent. Um, Carol, coming back to the chamber briefly, if I can. Obviously, you 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 you're flanked by two. Uh, chamber member companies who have uh, an, an excellent uh, support offer, but the chamber itself is offering direct support to British businesses as well. And one of the ways we like to refer to it is, if you're a company and you're unsure about going into a market, it's almost like you've got a bit of a butler service to get into that market. We take you from where you're starting from in the UK through to where you need to be. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the kind of support, whether it's uh, uh, specific services or moral and psychological support that the chamber can provide? Okay, well, I guess um, especially the chamber and also especially the business support service uh, where I where I work, we're, we're really there. We were set up to help the UK companies who are looking to export or looking at exploring even Singapore as an export destination. So they're not they don't need to be in a situation where they're ready to establish an entity here. Um, sometimes we're just you know, we'll just help them out to find out um, X, Y, and Z information that they're looking for. Um, sometimes it's just a market research just for them to see is there potential or not. If there is potential, we help them to identify some business partners that are suitable to their business and put them in contact with them. Um, and I guess the fact that we're based here uh, obviously helps. Uh, we have a we're the strong network of the chamber, you know, the, the 2,700 members that are part of our network that are helping us. We have the 15 business groups that we run and um, that are helping us in sharing the information and giving us access to some of the stakeholders. Basically, we're, we're there to give shortcuts um, to companies, point them in the right direction. Uh, sometimes we, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the service we offer are obviously free services. I would be pointing them in the direction of uh, a certain link on the uh, Ministry of Manpower website or Ministry of uh, or ACRA, yes. So it would be just putting them in, in touch with some of the information that's there available, but yeah. making it easier to get access to the information. So in a sense what we've got here is a comprehensive offer. We've got the offer for those who are exploring the market. We've got the offer for those who are ready to establish, and then we've got the offer for those who are ready to think about bringing people in uh, in order to expand their business as well. Uh, it, it, it is comprehensive, and uh, I think it's one I hope that more and more of our UK companies will take advantage of. Just as a final uh, question to all three of you, if you had to summarize, and this is sort of unfair because you're not prepared for this, uh, if you had to summarize uh, the experience of doing business in Singapore and why Singapore is a great place, just in a couple of sentences, um, what would be your pitch back to UK companies thinking about Singapore as an excellent market? Mark, can I start with you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Fresh remark. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've been here over three and a half, four years now. Um, I came to set up uh, the, the law firm here in Singapore. Uh, we offer immigration services. Um, and from that, what I've found is the, the business community is very, very open and welcoming. Um, Singapore does have quite a high number of expats. Um, what you do find is that the Singaporeans are quite happy to do business with expats. 
uh, the, the the overall structure of Singapore is very much pro business. It's pro investment. It's pro developing its actual economy. I think the the government has just recently announced that it's turning Singapore into a smart nation, trying to make things easier for the community, easier for um, any of the residents here in Singapore. And I, I, I can only really say. Um, really top things about Singapore. Also, if you stand outside now, it's about 32 degrees, so you can't really see it <laughs> Don't make us jealous back here in London. Graham, over to you. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> yeah, I think just to reiterate what Mark said, it's completely commercially focused here, and that really is night and day to, to the rest of the region. Uh, it's easier to do business here than the UK, than the US. It's 100% focused, and that's through fiscal policy, through government policy, it really is easy to do business here. Um, the thing I say to, to companies is use the chamber for the services they offer, do your due diligence, and if you from that, if you think there's you know, even an inclination, there's potential here, come establish an entity, whatever type of entity, but get, get sort of a presence in the region and you'll get some traction here. Excellent. And Carol, what, what's your elevator pitch? Right, it's going to be hard now to not repeat what they have said, <laughs> I have to say. Um, yeah, I think it's just the, the whole business environment here in Singapore is really vibrant. There's a really positive uh, vibe everywhere you go. Uh, people are looking to do business. There's, there's a great buzz around. Uh, it's this work hard, play hard um, environment. And obviously also, like Mark was saying, you know, uh, a lovely, lovely surrounding. Excellent. Um, well, I want to take the opportunity, if I may, to thank all of you for being with us today. Uh, I'm sure our attendees as well have found this incredibly interesting. And just by way of closing, um, I want to come on to our additional webinars, which will be coming up in the next few weeks. On the 8th of July, uh, we will discover Colombia, a country that I had a privilege to visit just two years ago, incredibly open for business, incredibly interested in doing more business with Britain. So there might be some competition for Singapore from uh, Colombia in, in the weeks to come. And again, on the 21st of July with the United Arab Emirates, where we'll be focusing more specifically on opportunities in the technology and creative sectors, areas where the UAE is looking to diversify its economy after, obviously, a very long period focused more on the extractive industries. Um, if you'd like to get information about any of these markets, from Singapore to Colombia to the UAE and beyond, please do visit Export Britain, uh, which is the international trade and export resource from the British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, the web address is www.exportbritain.org.uk. Whilst there on the Export Britain website, if you'd like a referral to a particular market, we have the capacity to take your information and ensure that you get referred to a Chamber of Commerce or a business group uh, in a market where you are interested in doing business. And I encourage everyone who's viewing this webinar to do, the, do that for Singapore in the first instance. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention uh, that we have the British Chambers of Commerce International Trade Conference coming up on Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2015. Uh, if you'd like to join us in person, uh, you are able to do so uh, via the British Chambers of Commerce website. Um, if you would like to uh, join us virtually, there will be opportunities to do so via social media, uh, and we hope that we can get that conference to trend around the world and get more UK businesses than ever excited in the two-way trading opportunities that are available, whether that be with Singapore or with markets everywhere else. Um, my name is Adam Marshall. Uh, it's been my privilege to host this webinar from the BCC's offices in London. Thanks again to our colleagues at the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, uh, as well as to Graham Hotness and Mark Chowdhury, uh, experts who can help make your business journey into Singapore become easier indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.